Hello everyone and welcome to Biohackers Lab. I'm your host Gary Cohen and on today's episode I have Dr. John Lemansky. Dr. Lemansky is a board certified physician of internal medicine practicing, practicing in the state of California. Dr. Lemansky feels the majority of diseases he encounters on a daily basis in practice is as a direct result of the typical American diet. He is also the co-host of the popular keto podcast show called The Keto Hacking MD along with his other co-host Jimmy Moore. John thanks so much for coming on to the show today. Yeah, Gary, thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. So your title, the Keto Hacking MD, that's why I had to get you on. I mean, you you combine <laughs> you combine the best of both worlds, I guess. It's the the knowledge evidence-based world of medicine, but also the N1 equals kind of results world and biohacking or hacking world. So, yeah, I think yeah. we're going to get a lot of good information out of you today. Good. Looking forward to it. So I guess my first question for you then is what got you interested in self-experimentation or um, biohacking in general? Yeah, you know, biohacking is becoming pretty popular. Uh, but as you know, it's something that we've been doing for a long time. Uh, me personally, my story really started with nutrition. So kind of the genesis of keto hacking is when I was uh, in medical school, um, I was very fit. Uh, you know, was a triathlete, did a lot of running, and found out that I was actually um, insulin resistant and pre-diabetic, which didn't make sense to me at the time, uh, because here I was in my early 20s, you know, basically eating the pescatarian sort of diet, no fat, uh, doing all the recommendations, and yet, even with exercise, I was actually metabolically sick. And at the time, there wasn't much information out there about low-carb or ketogenic um, so I started kind of doing some research and really what was popular at all was um, Atkins. Uh, so I started reading about Atkins and doing some more clinical research and kind of looking through the studies to see what information was out there. And that was kind of a genesis to find out that low carb and keto was kind of the way to go. With that, I've always been interested in kind of how do you become as healthy as possible? And so now with all the technology that's come out with, you know, I saw you have your or a ring, and there's a lot of ways to actually quantify data, it's very easy to now kind of figure out, well, beyond nutrition, what else is going to impact our body? And so for me as a physician, trying to figure out, number one, how to really augment my health, but also those that I take care of, it really became a natural kind of genesis to go from just nutrition, which I think is extremely important, to start looking at other things such as sleep, stress reduction, all the other biohacks that you and I kind of start focusing on. <clears throat> it really started focusing too on sleep as the first biohack for myself because as a medical student, you know, they make us work crazy long hours, 36 hours straight. And I would start noticing how I felt tremendously changed when I started having to work late at night. And so I started looking at sleep patterns and the influence of that on metabolic health. And so it's kind of been a progression from there in terms of figuring out how do you really optimize yourself by using nutrition, but also biohacking. Mm. And I guess, is it, would you say, um, in when you're beginning your training, the focus is mainly on treating a disease. So kind of like in medicine, the focus is, okay, patient's got, got the condition, let's, let's get it better. But sort of... Right. It seems like nowadays a lot of focus is now becoming on like lifestyle medicine to go, okay, we don't want to just treat the disease once it's here. We actually want to try prevent the disease from coming. And that's, I, I guess, is people like yourself now when you get to that stage where you think, no, I don't want to just treat the disease. I actually want to make myself better. And how, if I can do that, how can I then educate patients on how to do the same? Yeah, it's, it's one of these things where the way that we are trained as physicians, um, it's kind of backwards in the sense that once you know what the disease is, we know how to treat it in the sense that we can give medications, we can do surgeries, we can do interventions. We're also taught how to differentiate between different uh, symptoms and try to find out what the disease processes are. But we're not very good at prevention. We really are not. Um, and I think part of that has to do with cost. Uh, there's no money to be made in prevention at this point. Um, and we're trained a little bit differently. So I always tell people, look, if you've been in a traumatic situation, car accident, had a stroke, had a heart attack, you want to be in a first world country, United States, UK, Europe, somewhere where the intervention is going to be life saving. But beyond that, you know, you would think big industrial countries like ours would be at the top in terms of health prevention, and we're not. Um, so I hope that there is a focus that now is switching over to 
how do we prevent all these things? Because at least in the United States, diabetes accounts for 50% of all the money that we spend on healthcare. And the numbers are staggering. Somewhere in the effect of $245 billion per year is spent either on treatment or lost wages in the United States alone. And that was from 2017. And so the numbers are just exorbitant. I think as a society, we have to figure out how do we actually prevent these diseases versus just trying to manage them chronically. Mm -hmm. So yeah, there is a, it's going to be a slow process though. And I think that it's actually going to be more from grassroots movements where people are, are starting to demand, hey, you know, for 50 years, you've been telling me to do it a certain way and it's not working. So give me a solution. And that's where I think the change is going to come from. Mm. Well, when I recently I was looking at um, some famous doctors and scientists who became famous because of N equals one experiment. And sure. a classic example was the person who discovered um, helico pylori yeah. bacteria pylori, yeah. and i mean he won the nobel prize but he had to actually take it to prove the concept so he had to do an experiment on himself to say look it, yep. i think i figured it out and not only did he win the nobel prize but before that he was ridiculed i mean he was ostracized from the medical community uh down in australia and they made they thought he was a, a, a laughing stock so eventually they came around where he got the nobel prize but he suffered tremendously for saying look this is what's happening and you see that repeatedly in, in medical history where that happens um, because I think it's hard to move the needle in terms of collective beliefs in anything, not just medicine, but anything in society. It's very, very difficult to really change directions. And we see that with saturated fat and the impact that that's had on our health and, and kind of global perspective of what fat does. Hmm. So just for anyone listening who, who didn't know what I just talked about with that bacteria is, is the thing that causes stomach ulcers is what? They so yeah, yeah. Interestingly enough, um, and our thought process is actually changing on H. pylori in the sense that before people would have ulcers and they didn't really know what it was. They thought it was maybe too much acid production. This physician down in Australia said, "No, look, it's actually a bacteria, and this bacteria actually destroys the lining um, and uses the lining of the gut to actually survive. But by changing the pH, it causes ulcers." Now we found that you can have H. pylori and not necessarily have symptoms. Um, so the question is, is it causative? Is it just there? Is there something else that's changed in, in dietary or environmental things that have actually made it uh, come to light? Hmm. Yeah, in terms of what you're explaining, still, initially, he was ridiculed for saying that H. pylori is actually something that is real. Mm -hmm. So let's get into some of your favorite hacks that you've discovered. And yeah. I guess nutrition is the big one, as you mentioned there, because that's a, a foundation that causes a lot of uh, conditions from there. So how would you start a biohacking diet or what, what, where would you begin? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, so obviously I believe in a ketogenic lifestyle, low carb, high fat. Um, but I will say with the caveat being that if you are metabolically healthy, meaning you do not have insulin resistance, you do not have diabetes, you don't necessarily have to be extremely ketogenic or low carb. Um, so that I think is something that is important to understand. The majority of people who come to keto or low carb are really metabolically sick. And so for them, it's very important to basically remove all the uh, refined carbohydrates and carbohydrates to basically reset the system, decrease insulin, decrease uh, glucose, leptin, ghrelin, all these different hormonal impacts. What I would say to most people is take it in steps. So if you are eating a regular kind of Western or SAD diet, as we call it, basically refined carbohydrates, sugars, Start off by removing all those things. So remove fast food, junk food, refined carbs, uh, sodas, anything that is basically has fructose, high fructose corn syrup in it. If you do that alone, I think that's about 75% of the battle. Then you start getting into kind of the weeds of what's the best diet at that point. Is it paleo? Is it primal? Is it you know keto? Is it low carb, high fat? And I think the answer to that really depends on what you are metabolically. Are you extremely ill, meaning do you have significant insulin resistance, leptin resistance? If you have those two things, I think it's extremely important to really go as hardcore ketogenic as you can to basically kind of reset your system, allow your insulin to come down, allow the cells to basically uh, upregulate insulin receptors so that when you go back to eating healthy carbohydrates, your body can process it a lot, a lot better. 
Um, but there is this fallacy that all carbohydrates are bad. And I think that might be some of the backlash from the ketogenic low carb community stating that all carbohydrates are bad, which in essence, they really aren't. Mm. So you've mentioned some markers there. Is that also something then you would suggest to people as a base? A um, couple of those uh, blood tests or markers to figure out where, where, how far in the spectrum they should go. Yeah, so I'm a big data person because it helps me direct kind of treatment. So I believe that one, if, if cost is not an issue, then the lab, labs are very important in my opinion. And the major labs that I would say are, as I mentioned, insulin. Uh, so fasting insulin with C-peptide, which tells you how much insulin is basically produced. But fasting glucose is extremely important. You know, if you're ketogenic or low carb, uh, blood and breath ketones are extremely important as a marker to basically kind of direct you in terms of is what you're doing actually benefiting you? Are you producing uh, ketones, which we can talk about as a kind of byproduct of fatty acid metabolism? Um, and then simple things like hemoglobin A1C, just to have an idea of, of where you're beginning from. Um, I, I think there's a lot of markers that we can go into, um, especially when we talk about cholesterol. So I'll do an NMR lipid profile to really kind of break down the different types of lipids to see where am I starting from. And then depending on how in-depth you want to go, there's a lot of markers that you can look at that can give you a lot of in insight into what's going on. Mm. But those those ones you just mentioned, they are a pretty good base. And I think they're, they're accessible in most countries in the world, just a lipid profile, um, yeah. an insulin test, and a HbA1c. Yeah, and I think it's becoming much more common, especially in the United States. You can actually get those labs done by yourself without a physician um, in a lot of states by going online to different kind of resources. Um, and I think most GPs in, in Europe would test those labs for you anyways. Mm -hmm. Okay, and you've done some very interesting experiments yourself. Yeah. <laughs> so I'd like to maybe just jump into that um, it, with your podcast. Um, You've done a few different seven-day experiments. What have you discovered in yourself then? So just as a background, I've been doing self-experimentation for probably 12, 13 years. Um, just to see because how do you take this information, which is vast in terms of the medical information that's out there, and really figure out how does it apply to you? Because when we look at medical studies, number one, a lot of them are done in mice or rats. The other ones that are done in, in humans you're looking at a population base and we're trying to extrapolate from a population that may or may not be the same as you and saying, well, this applies to everybody. And I don't necessarily agree with that. I think randomized control trials, perspective studies are great to give us an idea of overall, but that doesn't necessarily mean it's going to apply to the individual. And so I, I'm very big proponent of saying, okay, here's the data, here are the studies. Now let's try it on, on ourselves and say, well, you know, this does apply to you because there's a lot of genetic variabilities like SNPs that can impact whether or not you're successful doing different hacks. So um, Jimmy Moore and I uh, met at a conference called KetoCon and we hit it off in the sense that we're both very big proponents of the N equals one experiments. Uh, so we decided to team up and try to get some more information out to the public about how do you actually implement these experiments and why should you? And so you being a biohacker, me being a biohacker, we know the influence of a lot of different hacks on our system. But a lot of people out there are still stuck at just nutrition. Um, and so it's, it's a way to basically educate people. Here are the different hacks. This is what you can expect. And the reason that Jimmy and I are doing it is because also we're on very different ends of the spectrum metabolically. So for me, I'm insulin sensitive now. I don't have any uh, prediabetes. Jimmy is on the other spectrum where he does have insulin resistance, and we respond very differently. So we started off with uh, probably the cheapest biohack, which was a seven-day water and electrolyte fast. Um, to basically show, number one, what's the process as you experience this for people who want to try it? And then to discuss what are the health benefits from short day fast, intermittent fast, time restricted feeding, and then longer term fast. Um, we followed that up with a very high protein uh, experiment, which we got a lot of pushback from <laughs> a lot of people in the community. But what we wanted to talk about also is this question of uh, satiation and satiety. You know, in the ketogenic world, we think fat is really the predominant macronutrient that causes that. But then on the flip side, there's another camp that will say, well, it's actually protein. 
Um, and so what we did is we did a, um, a three to one protein to fat ratio. Where basically we ate very, very lean protein, had a little bit of fat and remove all the carbohydrates. And we measured blood and breath ketones, blood glucose, uh, fasting insulin, fasting glucose, NMR lipid profile, and something called HOMA IR, which is a measure of insulin resistance. Um, and then we just recently finished an experiment where we did 90% fat to 10% protein to also measure those same parameters and see, you know, number one, how do you feel? What's the cognitive uh, impact? And then what happens to the actual lab values, uh, which I thought was very fascinating. Did you get anything that shocked you that you didn't expect? So the fasting one, I've done fasting uh, for quite a while now. I would say probably about 10 years. Um, the longest I've done is seven days. And I still think that fasting in and of itself is probably one of the most beneficial and cheapest biohacks that we can do. So not too much surprising from that. Uh, from the high protein, so before I went uh, ketogenic, what I would experience myself is I would have a meal, which I thought was pretty healthy. And then post meal, I would have a 30 minute or so hypoglycemia, which I wasn't checking at the time, but I would feel hypoglycemic. And then I would be starving again. When I went back to the protein experiment, I had the same symptom again. And it was, it was horrible because one of the benefits I find from doing low carb or keto is that I never think about food. Uh, you know, when I'm hungry, I eat, but it's not something that um, I'm always thinking about. And when I went to high protein, I started thinking about food pretty much all day long. Um, I will say the positive takeaway was that I did start increasing my protein intake a little bit. Uh, before I was about 70 grams per day, and now I'm, I'm up to about 90 grams per day. So there was some positive takeaway from that. And then the high fat one um, was basically what I do normally. So uh, pushing it to 90% fat was a little bit of a challenge in terms of kind of figuring out what I could eat in the ratios. Uh, but as far as takeaway from that, I felt great. Ketones were you know about where they are. Uh, but my co-host had a very, very different experience with the two, which we talk about and I think is very fascinating. So Jimmy actually had hypoglycemic episodes, uh, about 15 episodes during the high protein diet. And also during the high fat diet, he actually had a hypoglycemic episode where he was down in the 40s on his glucose and very symptomatic. Um, I don't know the conversion over to European, but it was in the 2.7, 2.8, I think. Yeah, that's low. Yeah. Very low. And, and when he was fasting, um, he was down in the very low 50s, 51, and felt amazing because his ketones were you know, very high. So we're going to discuss why he had these hypoglycemic episodes um, on the podcast. And then what we do is we bring in other physicians or scientists to kind of delve into the experiments and why we get results we did. Um, and I know you had Ben uh, Bickman on your show. So we had Ben on ours discussing kind of insulin glucagon resistance. So the takeaway that I get from a lot of these N equals one, or I guess in our case, N equals two experiments is that number one, what is the impact metabolically to people based on their different kind of genetic makeup, but also different metabolic makeup? which I think is very fascinating and, and can actually give quite a bit of information to the community at large. Yeah. I'll, and again, just as how you got both of you there who are meant to both be fat adapted, both being on a ketogenic diet for many years, and Correct. yet you metabolically, metabolically have very different responses to the same diet experiments. Correct. Yeah. And I think it's because you know, in the United States, and I'm sure over the, the rest of the world, our focus on health is really reflected by our focus on weight. And I don't agree with that. And what I mean by that is that, you know, we use weight as the kind of barometer of success. If you draw 50 pounds, you know, you are healthy now. And the reality is that somebody who's done a tremendous amount of metabolic damage to their body is going to have a very, very difficult time actually starting to lose weight. They might get metabolically improved on a ketogenic, low carb, paleo, whatever diet they decide. But as far as the weight, it's going to be much harder for them to lose weight than somebody who's not as metabolically sick. And so Jimmy gets a lot of flack because he still has weight to lose and people think that he cheats and you know he's not really following a low-carb diet. And the reality is he is. It's just for him to actually get down on the weight, it's going to be tremendously difficult. And that reflects for a lot of people who are you know morbidly obese or obese who are concerned, well, why isn't this working for me? Well, the reality is it is, but it's just going to take 
a lot longer and it might not get to where you have a six pack or APAC or whatever your goal is. Hmm. Well, I had um, Dr. Tro on um, Collegian. And, um, hmm. So his episode hasn't gone live yet as we were speaking, but you know, he, he went from morbidly obese of 350 pounds down to, I think he's in the 190s now or something. And he, he one of his takeaways from going for, uh, it being in that obese state, he said, um, and the benefit of a low carb or more ketogenic type of diet is that hunger and satiety thing. That right. And so do you, you, it was interesting for you to what you said there that you found when you were eating a higher protein diet that you actually were more hungry again. So, um, but I guess that could be again different between different people. It can, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, I think in isolation, so you have to remember that we are pushing the ratios very, very high. So basically, when you do a high protein, which was basically three to one, so three grams of protein for one gram of fat. You think about it in those terms. So number one, I was in a caloric deficit. Uh, I was consuming about 1,400 calories per day. Uh, my normal probably is about 2,000, 2,100, something like that. Um, we basically call that kind of diet um, rabbit starvation because there is essentially no fat. Um, but the question was really, you know, if you push protein to a very high state, will it make you satiated and will you achieve satiety? And you do, for a very short period of time, have satiation. If I eat a very high protein diet, I will feel full pretty quickly in that diet, in that meal. But the satiety impact is quite different. Whereas, you know, 30 minutes after the meal, I get hypoglycemic, which leads to a kind of metabolic response, which leads to hunger. Basically, your brain is saying, look, you're hypoglycemic, you need to bring in energy. And so that satiety goes way down, which... A lot of proponents who are doing a very high protein diet are saying, well, it actually makes you have higher levels of satiety, and we didn't actually find that to be true. And I think the difference is that people who are eating a higher protein are also consuming higher amounts of fat. So like the carnivore diet, where you're basically doing a one-to-one -one ratio of fat to protein, that's more realistic as far as causing satiety. Um, but yeah, I think... I definitely didn't didn't feel very good on that experiment. <laughs> I won't do that again. Okay. Yeah. Um, but again, I just love because uh, what I'm finding, um, I mean, in, we're speaking in 2018 and especially the carnival diet seems to be blowing up in 2018 at the moment. But yep. I've seen where you're getting a lot of people who are either paleo, low carb or even ketogenic who are going, oh, is this maybe what I need to try too? So they're, they're right. doing that transition to say, it seems like a spectrum to go, oh, should I go all the way to carnivore? And again, as we're talking about here, you could try it and then these are some of the, the things you need to be cognizant of, aware of. And do you think seven days would be enough or would you have? Would, do you think there's like an adaptation process that you may have needed to have gone through like a 30-day or a 60-day would have been more sufficient? Yeah, I, I think there's definitely that um, aspect of it. Um, I can tell you that 30 days of that high amount of protein um, would have been very, very challenging. I don't think I would have enjoyed 30 days of my life that way. Um, I do think that, yeah, that, that is the negative kind of feedback that uh, we have gotten is that seven days is not enough to really kind of adapt to whatever you're doing. On the flip side of that, if you're doing the very high protein, uh, even the guy who kind of recommended that we try it said, don't do it for more than seven days because it's quite extreme. But something like the carnivore, if I were to try the carnivore, which I've thought about, I would say I would give it at least 30 days to kind of see the adaptation and, and what my response is. Absolutely. Okay. And that's an arbitrary number. I mean, we don't know is 30 days really enough mm -hmm. metabolically to see a difference. Um, is 60 days, is 90 days. We don't really have an answer to that. But I think definitely something more than seven days. And then when you were talking about the really high fat diets uh, with the 90%, do you, I, I think, <clears throat> um, like a concern I've, I've heard from some is that you can actually consume too much fat and that causes a weight issue in itself. Do you think that's also a problem within the ketogenic diet community that they maybe consume too much fat um, and that halts the weight loss that maybe some people require? Yeah. Um, so part of the reason that we did the very, very high kind of fat, and again, I'm only consuming about 1,400 calories. So calorie wise it wasn't a massive amount but there is a fallacy i think or there's a misunderstanding for people who are new to ketogenic or low carb that uh, being in ketosis is the same thing as losing weight 
Um, so you can be in, in high, higher levels of ketosis and maintain your weight because you're consuming too many calories in terms of fat. Uh, ideally, people will say, well, fat is, is going to give you that satiation and satiety, so you can't really eat too many calories of fat. But I would say that that is true if you were consuming fat from like products, so meat products. So if you were doing a carnivore one-to-one, yes. But when we start talking about ketogenic, a lot of people I've noticed will have an issue where they consume a lot of their fat calories from MCT oils, uh, basically liquid fats, which you can absorb a tremendous amount of calories from liquid fats being ketosis because the MCT is being converted to ketones, not lose weight and theoretically gain some weight. Um, so there is that kind of confounding of information that we're really trying to push to the ketogenic community saying, look, it's okay to be in ketosis. It's okay to use some of those um, liquid fats, but do it in moderation if you're trying to lose weight um, or if you're trying to maintain your weight. Mm -hmm. So I guess, what are your views on supplementation? Um, in general or a specific type of supplement? Well, I guess talking again, coming back to the concept of what's going to make you healthy and that ultimate goal of just being well, do you believe then if someone's on a low carbohydrate diet or a ketogenic diet that there's probably a good chance that they will need some level of supplementation if they are, want to stay healthy? So uh, my answer to that depends on a couple of things. Um, the number one thing I would say is the quality of the food that you're consuming. Um, so I am a big proponent of quality. Um, I know you had, um, what is his name? Uh, Dr. J on, mm. um, we're talking about grass versus grain fed beef. So if you're consuming high quality ingredients, meaning, you know, grass fed, grass finished beef, um, high quality fish that is not uh, tainted, I, I don't believe that you necessarily need to have massive amount of supplementation to to maintain your health. I think you can get the majority of your micronutrients and macronutrients from food as long as the quality is good, and then you can supplement that a little bit. Having said that, it's very, very difficult, I think, to find that high quality uh, source of food. And I, I spend a lot of my time making sure that what I consume, what I tell people to consume is coming from those high quality sources. I do do so, some supplementation for myself. So on a ketogenic or low-carb, I do recommend that we supplement uh, sodium, potassium. Magnesium is a big one that I think most people are deficient in. Um, I do do a high-quality fish oil supplement, um, and I do some um, NAD supplementation for myself. Sometimes I'll throw in some zinc supplementation in a cycle. Um, but in general, I think if you're going from a, a Western or you know very high carbohydrate, refined carbohydrate diet to all of a sudden now you're consuming something that is higher quality ingredients, then I don't think you necessarily need to go crazy with the supplementation. Yeah, it's, and as you said there, I guess there's going to be potentially be some supplements that you might feel, okay, if in my case, I want to do this more longer term it's something that i just feel better on or there's going to be like cyclical ones there's going to be periods where you're going to supplement for a right. period of time for whatever reason just to boost up you feel good and then you don't take it again correct and you have to be very careful in terms of supplements because you know at least in the united states they're not regulated by the fda mm -hmm. meaning that you don't really know what's in them unless you know the source and it has to be a, a good quality source um i definitely travel quite a bit and especially when i travel multiple time zones or if i travel to europe i usually will push the supplementation a little bit more because there's an extra stressor on the body so i definitely kind of do my regimen or the regimen that i recommend to people based on what's going on in, in their life if there's more metabolic stress uh, mitochondrial damage that i could uh, anticipate then i'll push the supplementation a little bit stronger so molecular h2 things like that will be added but but not on a consistent basis where you're taking it every day mm. yeah i mean the, the things that you're you're mentioning there that's always at the biohacking conferences now you know yeah. uh, taking h2 water and um yeah. doing a whole bunch of stuff and it seems like a lot of it is around the mitochondria so anything that can stimulate that mitochondria um right. is what people are, are aiming for and that's right. ultimately what we're doing with sort of like the ketogenic diet isn't it? it's trying to mm. make the mitochondria work more efficiently Absolutely. So we really believe, especially in the biohacking community, that the mitochondria are at the base of, of a lot of metabolic diseases. So you know, if you look at Dr. Sifrid's uh, research on cancer 
and having uh, fermentation from a dysfunctional mitochondria as really kind of the source of this. Anything with a chronic metabolic disease, obviously there's hormonal impact, but we believe that the mitochondria is really being affected in a negative way. And so as you mentioned, when you're on a ketogenic uh, diet or low carb, basically what you're doing is you're improving the oxidation at the mitochondrial level, meaning that when you burn fatty acids versus glucose as your substrate, you make less ROS. So you make less of these uh, kind of reactive oxygen species, which I tell people it's basically your body rusting inside as, is what it is. So you get hydrogen peroxide as a free radical, and it basically damages all the cells in your body. If you do it on a continuous basis where you're chronically inflamed, that's basically what's happening in a nutshell. And so when you go ketogenic, you're basically allowing the mitochondria to be much more fuel efficient, producing less of these reactive oxygen species. So you get less metabolic damage and less aging. Um, so yeah, absolutely. Okay. So I guess that's the basis of what we're talking about for good long-term health. If you've got this healthy mitochondria and it sounds like the low carb ketogenic diet is, is a preferred method to try to stimulate that. And you may need some supplementation. Um, are you interested in IV kind of uh, supplementation, doing intravenous stuff straight into your body? Uh, do you, do you, have you ever played with that? Yeah, I've tried a few different ones. Um, you know, I've done glutathione. Um, I've done NAD. Um, obviously, like a Myers cocktail with just electrolytes. Um, my take on biohacking is that you know, if you're a multimillionaire, billionaire, you can have all the fancy tools. You can have the hyperbaric oxygen, you can have the cryo chamber, you can have, you know, the latest, greatest tool, all the IV stuff you need. The majority of people, that's not realistic. And so my goal is to say to people, well, within the constraint of your life, which is, you know, most people in the United States are living paycheck to paycheck. What is it that you can do in a biohack kind of uh, sort of way that's not going to break your bank, that's going to be affordable, that's going to be realistic. So for most people, I would say, you know, you, you don't need all that stuff. For myself, I will say, well, I'd like to try it because if I'm telling people, you know, you might want to consider this, I want to see the impact that I have. I will tell you the glutathione and the NAD are pretty, pretty miserable experiences if you've ever had them do, you know, IV injections. It's, it's, you feel like you're going to basically die. So wouldn't re wouldn't recommend it on a daily basis. But yeah. Well, that's good to know. I haven't actually done yeah. the IV route because uh, I've well, just also when I'm traveling to conferences, I'm a bit concerned about having an IV done in a foreign country just in case something happens to me. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> that's a good point. Yeah, yeah. but um, that's that's good to know then that's potentially, okay, just watch out, especially thinking, oh, uh, glutathione or NAD is going to boost my mitochondria. I'm going to feel all energetic. Right. But as you said, right. it wasn't a, a pleasant experience. Yeah, and I think um, there's other ways to basically um, provide the same benefit. So just for people who aren't aware, so NAD, NAD plus is basically a redox. So you can look at the cells as basically like a battery. And so you're getting uh, electron uh, kind of transportation and that basically impacts your body's ability to regenerate um, energy. And so one of the ways that you can actually augment NAD instead of getting the IV, which you know, it's not covered by insurance in the United States. It's about, I want to say $2,000 to, to have it done. So most people are not going to want to pay that. You can do some extended fasting. Extended fasting will increase your NAD levels tremendously. And so I like to really show people, you know, obviously the spectrum of what you can do, but realistically for most people, you know, this is what you, you, you can do, which is not going to be you know, exorbitant and break your bank. And that's why I, I love getting people like you on the show because that's exactly my mentality is going, okay, is that spectrum again to say, right. you know, where you live in the world or what your financial situation is, these are si kind of the options you can play with. But as a basis right. of good health, this is actually what you can do. And it hopefully isn't actually going to cost you much. And you can do it again anywhere in the world. That's the ultimate. Right. Absolutely. And there's, there's, you know, I could probably name 10, 15 biohacks that you could do that are not going to cost you any money, um, but that will tremendously, you know, improve your health. Okay. Well, let, maybe let's get a little bit into some because you talked about the sure. fasting was a great one. The kind of food yep. and, you know, mm -hmm. eating a low carb or ketogenic diet doesn't have to break the bank or be super fancy. Um, right. That's really easy to do. What a, yep. What's another sort of lifestyle tip that you would then recommend? Yeah, after nutrition, I, I still believe firmly that sleep mm -hmm. is the next biohack that is extremely important. Um, and 
a couple of things that kind of really point me in that direction. So anybody who's had young children like yourself and has had sleepless nights can really kind of um, test to the next day. Number one, obviously you don't feel good, but I've always found that my uh, carbohydrate cravings go through the roof. Yeah. Um, and my and I've actually tested it in the sense that my uh, fasting glucose will be higher, my uh, resting ketones will be lower because basically you, what happens, well, you get a cortisol response, which is one of the major stress hormones, and that impacts insulin and also glucose and um, ketone production. So after nutrition, once you've really kind of dialed that in, I think sleep and, if, and impacting sleep is tremendously important. And so there's simple things that you can do for that that don't cost money. So I always find the simplest thing is turn off your iPhones, your iPads, your computers, anything electronic that has blue light emission, I will tell people not to use it for about three hours before going to bed. Um, for a lot of people, that's very, very difficult because that's our way of communicating with the world these days. Um, but I have noticed myself that if I'm traveling and I have some of these uh, devices on, even with all the other measures that I take, my deep sleep, my REM sleep go down tremendously. And, and that is something that, um, you know, it's one thing to sleep very long, so like eight hours or more. It's another thing to actually get the quality of sleep that we want, which is the deep and the REM sleep, which you and I track with our um, aura ring. Mm. Um, yeah, so sleep would be the next thing that I would really... And I, I fully agree with you about that kid thing. <laughs> I mean, I've noticed, uh, yeah, the next day, if I've had a bad night's sleep, man, yeah, your craving levels are, are, are different. I guess because, you, as you said, the cortisol and, the, and just you feel like, oh, I need to lift myself. I'm, I'm struggling here today. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. And what I found fascinating is that that cortisol response doesn't go back down to normal right away. It actually lasts about 24 to 48 hours. So they've done studies where they've actually taken people and randomized them into an eight-hour uh, sleep window and a five-hour sleep window and measure cortisol response the next morning and then two days subsequently. And they found that the cortisol response, number one, is still much higher but also delayed uh, in terms of its effect. So you can have one bad night of sleep and it can affect you for two to three days down the road, which I thought was fascinating as well. Mm. Yeah, and um, the other tip you said about devices, I think is so simple. Yep. You know, again, it's something you can do anywhere in the world. And I, I got another reminder of myself recently when I went on a glamping. So glamping is when you do camping, yep. but it's a little bit more luxurious. But yeah, it, yeah, you know, yeah, of course, well. it's a place with no internet signal, no electricity, and just not being around any devices for 24 hours. Like I noticed my deep sleep was actually mm -hmm. completely different. So it's amazing how much, much our devices change. Much higher in terms of the deep sleep? Yeah, my deep sleep was much yeah. higher. Um, yeah. And it, who knows, is it because I was more active outside, more sunlight, um, just more less Probably. devices? I don't, yeah. Yeah, and I think you bring up an interesting point in that the question when you start doing all these biohacks is which one is actually impacting you? And I, I will say that it's a kind of a symbiotic relationship where, um, you know, most of us in kind of a Western way of living, uh, we are in a kind of a vicious negative cycle where we don't sleep very well. So the next day we're hungry uh, and we're stressed because of work, because of commute. And so we eat late at night so we don't sleep well. And it's just this vicious cycle. And now when you go camping, even if it's clamping, uh, you know, you remove the devices, you're outside, you're back in the normal circadian rhythm where you wake up with the sun, you go to bed with the sun going down, or, you know, more or less. Um, because there's so much research coming out now, especially from the Salk Institute, where they look at circadian rhythm and its impact. So every organ in your body, we know now, has its own circadian rhythm, which basically controls how the organ functions. And even something as sim simple as the pancreas, if you eat late at night, it actually suppresses melatonin production from the pancreas, um, which who would have thought that would happen, right? Uh, and when you have suppressed melatonin, you don't actually get those deep sleep and the REM sleep that you, you and I were talking about. So all these things become kind of uh, symbiotic uh, and they interact together. So in, either in a positive or a negative way. Mm. So I, I agree with you, especially with the camping. I sleep like a baby when I go camping or I'm away from technology. Yeah, and but I just think that tip that we're talking about here, because I always try and envision, I guess, tough case scenarios, someone who lives in the center of New York in a multi-story building high up, you know, they're inundated with EMFs or just the environment and the, and the food quality sourcing issues and stuff. But it's just like someone listening to us right now, like in that situation, how can they improve their life? And I think already you, you're showing 
things that even someone in an apartment in New York can do. Right. And I lived in New York for 10 years, so I'm very well aware of the the neighbors and the <laughs> Wi-Fi. And I didn't know about EMF and Wi-Fi and the impacts, but I will say that even in, in a city like that, New York, London, any any big major city, you can still biohack. Um, you can still improve your health. Will you get to the point um, of health as somebody who's in you know the middle of Iceland? Um, probably not. Um, but then again, part of my kind of focus on biohacking is making it applicable to real life. So it, it's great to be a nomad in the middle of the Canadian wilderness, you know, with no technology. But the reality is that most people cannot and do not want to do that. They want to biohack. They want to be healthy. So how can you do that? So like in a major city like that, well, you know, you can go to the park. Are you going to be away from EMF and especially with 5G coming out? Probably not. But you can ground yourself. You can get some sun exposure. Um, you can work on your water, um, the water that you drink by doing some filtration. Um, you can exercise. So there's a lot of things that you can do to really kind of augment your wherever you're living and still be relatively healthy. Mm. Well, I think those points you just mentioned there, those are probably some of the other points that you would say are easy hacks to do to improve your life. Because, um, sorry, I disrupted you on your on no, your, right. on your flow after the sleep talk. So, um, yeah. yeah, it's your circadian rhythm, timing timing that, <clears throat> um, and just getting outside. So, you're, fa- you're a fan of grounding um, as just a, as a health benefit? Yeah, I am. And the other thing as a physician... You know, the way I approach kind of biohacking is I always look at it, number one, is it going to hurt you? Is there a potential that it's going to hurt you? So, you know, is there any negative side effect from grounding? The second thing that I look at is, you know, in terms of research, is there really research that backs up the claims of you see on the blog and Twitter sphere where, you know, anybody can say, well, grounding is the most amazing thing. And then you realize, oh, okay, well, they own a company that sells you grounding mats. So, of course, they're going to say that. Hmm. Uh, so then, you know, I look to see if there's any research. Um, and then I try it myself. And, and so grounding basically the, is this concept that um, the earth has its own magnetic field. And that, again, when I talked about the NAD, NAD+, plus, you basically are either, everything in your life is either taking away electrons or energy or giving you electrons or giving you energy. And grounding is a very good way to basically kind of recenter, get some positive energy back into your system. And unless you're, you know, grounding yourself in dog, you know, poop, uh, there's really no <laughs> negative side effect of, of standing barefoot in the earth. Um, so what I like to do for people, especially in big cities or, or um, not really able to kind of get away from all the technology is go outside in an area you know is not sprayed with glyphosate or any other pesticides and basically ten, take 10, 15 minutes, put your feet in the ground, you know, get some sun exposure, try to do some meditation. Um, and you will find that there will be some tremendous health benefits and you'll feel much better throughout the day. Uh, I like the meditation you brought up because earlier this year I did a neurofeedback experiment on the first time. And, and after that, uh, and speaking to Freddie Starr, the psychiatrist who runs it, um, it was just he mentioned, you know, the, the long-term sort of brain training you want to do is meditation. And I never really thought of that as like brain training. Um, but it, for me too, just as a side note, I, I – I think a lot of the time, you know, we focus on diets, maybe on body physique, but like brain health and how simple yeah. as a hack to do is just to meditate because it costs you nothing and you and, it, and it's not time intensive. It doesn't have to be. Correct. And I don't know about you, but I find that, so I've done meditation. Um, I find it to be one of the most difficult things for me to do. Mm. I, I don't know. Just, uh, I guess my brain is always, always going. I have so many things that I have to take care of. But I, I, what I'll do is I'll wake up in the morning and I'll spend five to ten minutes doing meditation. But I find it to be extremely, extremely difficult um, because I think of all those things uh, throughout the day. Um, but yeah, as you mentioned, it's it's free, and I have found the benefits are amazing. Uh, and that, and again, I'm only talking ten minutes a day, but I, I find it to be you know calming. I feel much more men- mentally sharp. Um, the stress levels go down, and I think. When you, we see a lot of kind of depression, anxiety, suicides um, out there, part of that could be really kind of mitigated from doing some simple meditation. Mm. Do you ever get into social? Like uh, you've you brought up a, a really hot topic at the moment because some high profile people have committed suicide and through for various reasons. But um, an, an aspect I think 
might help a part of it is just the social community side of things and do you think maybe that's an aspect within the biohacking community or people who are looking for good long-term health that they need to definitely address that mm -hmm. they um they have better relationships with others not just with themselves like meditation is sort of like a a relationship with yourself um right. but you need to also address the relationships with others absolutely i think um and, and i think a lot of this is generational so i'm going to be 40 very soon um my interaction on the social media kind of world um is not the same as most people who are younger you know i i i'm on it uh relatively new um and i see some negative aspects of it which we're kind of seeing uh, come out where it's this idea that you're connected but you're not really connected to people because it's a it's a false connection the flip side of that is i get to meet amazing you know interesting people like yourself uh, by being on social media but i think if you do that in itself and you're not actually connecting with other people um, outside of it like real connection human connection um, eye to eye contact um, then you're you're going to miss a lot of the needs that human have which is that bond or that connection with another human being and i see this a lot when you go out to restaurants or you go places and you see everybody's on their phone uh, at dinner and that to me kind of makes me very sad because that is a time when you can have very very strong connections with other human beings so i think there's a place for the social media kind of aspect obviously but um it can get in the way of, of real human contact which i'm concerned about yeah um so yeah, absolutely. I think it's important to get in touch with yourself, but also with other people. So it's like you need to prescribe to people put, to put your phone down so you actually build <laughs> yeah. friendships again with other. Um, I can think yeah. of a classic one on Facebook recently. I don't know if it was on your Facebook, but a bunch of tourists were on a Venice boat, you know, in the typical touristy place of Venice uh, on this beautiful boat, and they were all on their phones. And so yeah. no one's looking up, actually enjoying the surroundings around them. They're on their phones, probably tagging someone on Instagram or whatever, you know. <laughs> yeah, I remember because I, I used to travel a lot and there wasn't cell phones, but, you know, a lot of people had their cameras or video uh, recorders and they would record the whole thing. And I would ask myself or I would ask them, like, are you ever going to look at that ever again? And, and most people would say, yeah, probably not. Uh, and you're missing actually the beauty of what you're trying to experience. And as you mentioned, I think you see that a lot with kind of social media. It's more important to, to tag yourself or tag the event than actually to enjoy the event. Mm, yeah. Um, yeah, we, I mean, we've covered a vast array of yeah. topics here, and I love it. Um, just because the whole idea with this podcast show is, is to try to take information and to make it actionable. And I think we've shared so many right. actionable tips already, which is fantastic. I mean, I love the ideas that you're coming up with, too. Uh, would there be any other um, hack or suggestion that we haven't covered that you, you feel quite strongly about? There's two that I really feel strongly about. So number one is uh, sauna, so infrared sauna. Um, number two would be cold therapy, uh, so cold thermogenesis. Those two are, are extremely important in my opinion. Uh, they're big topics. I don't know if we can go into depth in both of them, but just uh, briefly, I would say that the benefits, um, as we mentioned before, on the mitochondrial level, are tremendous for you know infrared sauna um, or any sauna uh, to that effect. Um, it's very important for brain health. So a lot of the studies looking at depression, anxiety, um, you know, infrared or sauna use actually is tremendously beneficial for that. And then I really like the cold thermogenesis, which I know is hard for a lot of people to actually do. Um, but I find that the brown adipose tissue kind of activation, the impact on uh, mitochondria, the impact on autophagy and mitophagy is tremendous. Um, and there's a way that you can kind of measure that, which I do, which is called the phase angle. Um, and so I'm kind of throwing out some big terms. But basically, not only do you want to have a lot of mitochondria, you want to get rid of the mitochondria that are not functioning very well. And that's called mitophagy. Basically, you kill them off. And there's ways that you can do that, and we've talked about quite a few of them. So fasting, being on a low-carb kind of uh, way of eating, uh, sauna does a tremendous amount of that, and cold thermogenesis will also do that. Um, and it will impact your sleep, uh, which is important, and it will decrease your cortisol, and or, uh, cortisol production, which is also important. So as I mentioned before, all these things basically work together, either positive or negatively, and so I try to do as many of these hacks, kind of stack these hacks, 
so that uh, I get the maximal benefit of all of them combined. So when it comes to sauna, what have you found out? Because, you know, you can either just get uh, a hot sauna or you get infrared saunas with lights and that. Um, have you found anything particular then that uh, you would, as a quick tip to people to say, if you're going to go the sauna route, that look for X, Y, or Z? Yeah, I, w- I mean, I personally have an infrared because I think the benefits are, are much better than um, your routine sauna. Having said that, again, uh, most people from a cost perspective, if you go and join a gym, most gyms are going to have either a wet or dry sauna. So those are actually quite beneficial. Um, it's really, if you look at the studies, um, and most of them are coming from Finland in terms of cardiovascular and cerebral vascular health, um, you have to do it for at least 19 to 20 minutes four times a week. So you have to be consistent in it. The other thing that I, I, one of the hacks that I kind of use is I will use the sauna after I work out. And so that'll actually boost uh, growth hormone and testosterone production quite a bit, especially if it's infrared. And so not only do you get benefit because number one, I usually will be fasted. So as I mentioned, I stack a lot of these hacks. So I will go fasted and do a workout, uh, mostly strength training, and then I'll follow that up with a sauna. Um, and so Number one, you're fasted, so you've burned through your glycogen stores, so your muscles are really using fatty acids or your own fat stores for energy, and then you kind of compound that by going into the sauna and really kind of boosting the demand metabolically, and so you get a huge uh, growth hormone, norepinephrine burst, all of which are going to make you feel better, so you're going to have less depression and actually improve muscle growth. And so if you start stacking these things in a, in a way that is beneficial, it, it really exponentially improves the outcome from it. I love that. I mean, that's such an actionable tip again there where I can think you join a gym, the gym has a sauna as, or as uh, I've got a friend in Finland and she, they call it sauna or so uh, they've got a different way, you know, Finnish way of saying it because they've all got that. Right. Um, but yeah, just the idea of, okay, this is how you want to go to gym, do, do your gym workout. But it's just time efficient too. What you're talking about there right. is a key aspect that I think a lot of people don't think about sometimes is that okay, it's nice to do all this stuff, but how do I actually fit it into my working day? And in this case, I can do an efficient workout, plus I get the 20 minutes in the sauna to be able to sort of stack them together. Exactly. And um, the other thing in terms of working out, you know, um, not most people have, you know, two to three hours to work out. So I I usually will recommend very high intensity burst. So basically hit exercises. Um, and do it in, in, in a cycle so that it really doesn't take more than 30 minutes to get, you know, the benefits that you need. Again, kind of thinking about time because, you know, as you have children, jobs, commute, uh, it becomes, time becomes extremely, extremely difficult to have. Um, so, yeah, I can probably within an hour and 20 minutes get everything that I need to accomplish and uh, then be set for the rest of the day. And so the cryotherapy, the cold thermogenesis mm-hmm. stuff, um what, it, what yeah. when do you incorporate that into your week or your day how do you how do you schedule that and any tips on that one yeah um so when you talk about cold thermogenesis obviously cryotherapy is very popular again from a cost perspective it's okay to spend 60 dollars per session but the flip side is you can also do something as simple as if you live in, in an environment where it's very cold you can go into a lake or into a pool um, what I will do is, because I travel a lot, is I will just do ice baths in the in the hotel. And I try to time my ice baths um, usually before bed. So 30 minutes, 20 minutes before bed because it'll drop my core temperature. And I will find that that actually impacts my sleep very, very positively. Or I'll have much higher deep and REM sleep. Um, so basically, in a typical day, I wake up pretty early, 4.30. I go uh, work out. I'll hit the sauna after that. Um, and then, you know, whatever my day entails, um, and then about 30, 40 minutes before I'm about to go to bed, I'll do the cold thermogenesis and sleep, sleep very well. Wow. Okay. So you, you've got uh, loads of ice in a hotel room and, and you're, you're going for it. (laughs) Basically, I, I, uh, I broke a a few ice machines in my day just from taking all the ice, but, uh, (laughs) And, and a small little tip on the on the cold thermogenesis, if you're going to do it that way in a bathtub, in a hotel or whatever, I usually tell people, put the water in first, so as you know, cold as possible, and then get in and then dump the ice in because it'll be much more uh, tolerable that way versus putting all the ice in, 
and then trying to tiptoe into it, which is probably one of the more painful experiences you could have. Yeah, I was. I recently watched a documentary on Wim Hof uh, and his yeah. method there, and yeah, I just, I just was thinking, yeah, when you jump into a frozen lake, you know, and oh, that shock, especially when it goes oh. past the belly button. It's always the, it's the oh. belly button issue. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, put your arms up and oh. Oh. yeah. So if I do it that way, I tend to do much better. So I'll just you know. Stack the ice next to the bathtub, get in, and then just start dumping. Okay. And, uh, much more tolerable. Great tip. Well, John, um, I mean, you've shared again so many cool things that are, and lifestyle tips that anyone can do anywhere in the world. And thank you for doing that. Yeah, for, of course. For anyone listening now, um, what are the best ways that they can keep up to date with you, follow you, or um, even potentially consult with you if they can? Yeah. So, I mean, I'm on social media. Um, I've um, been on social media, John Lemansky MD. Uh, I'm starting a new kind of um, side uh, component called BiohackMD, um, www.biohackmd.com, um, and on YouTube, we're basically trying to highlight everything that you and I have talked about today. So very similar in terms of all the different biohacks that are out there. How can you actually do them in a way that is you know, cost-effective, and but also what's the health benefits of it? Um, so people can go to my YouTube channel and. Um, see some interviews with uh people in the know um and then yeah i'm on social media so feel free to reach out um i cannot answer medical questions so i get a lot of medical questions but um i'm happy to engage and kind of talk about uh, biohacks and nutrition fantastic and again i'll link to all of this in the show notes for anyone who's listening so again thank you so much for your time today um it's been fantastic uh i'm yeah, I'm so glad I got you on. It's, uh, it's You've dropped some amaz- amazing knowledge bombs today and so actionable. So thank you again. Yeah. yeah, it was my pleasure. I will say, you know, I've been a big fan of yours for quite some time. So I love your interviews. And uh, so it was an honor to be on.